Thanks for subscribing to the Clive Barker podcast. We do this for you. Uh, this is the only podcast dedicated to the imagination of Clive Barker. In this episode, 189, Jose and I, I'm Ryan, we conclude the series dissecting the Marvel epic Hellraiser comics. We cover the Dark Holiday special, the Summer special, and the poster book. Uh, recently, we had an email about the progress of our interview books from last year's Kickstarter, and what we can tell you is that we're about, ha- about halfway through the process of transcribing these interviews. It's been quite a slog through this. Uh, if you try this at home, unless you're an expert typist, it takes about one hour for every 10 minutes of interview, so we've been looking into faster ways to get this done. Jose has been trying something with editing YouTube transcriptions, and I'm looking into an online service to help with this as well. Uh, The new goal is to get this done by year's end. Thank you for your patience, and we still have our list of backers and pre-orders, and we are forever indebted to you. Uh, We also can't wait to have our first book in print. Anyway, thanks for indulging this little update, and now back to the episode. It's, uh, it's episode 189, uh, Marvel at Hellraiser Part 8, and this is our final, uh, final in the series. Yeah, it's been a fun, fun series of episodes to do so far. Uh, brought us back to reading these comics, right? Which uh, yeah. some of these I hadn't read in a while, so that, that's always good. Yeah, and it was nice to go through them book by book and, you know, kind of analyze and talk about all the stories. Definitely. And, yeah, and now we're finishing up. And does it, I mean, I wish I knew the history of these specials, but it seems almost like they had leftover comics that they couldn't get out with the regular run of the series because they ran out of time. Uh, Sure. But also Marvel was known for making these uh, summer specials and annuals and stuff like that. So, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if this was also part of uh, some sort of planned schedule. Um, But yeah, some of these stories, especially for the, holiday special it seems like it was done around the time when they were doing the devil's brigade right because it's atkins balbarith and uh face and they're still talking about the the war on order uh that that the devil's brigade was all that's true yeah and I, i think the holiday special probably came out during the run and not after right yeah, and it definitely has a, a total holiday feel to it because it's about Christmas and there's yeah. Christmas tree and packages. Uh, as for the summer special, yeah, those stories could have come out on any issue of the Hellraiser TV show, yeah, uh, anthology show, um, comics. Uh, why am I <laughs> talking about a Hellraiser show? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, yeah, remember that remote control with the with the push pins? The in pins. It? Yeah, God, yeah that was so that. lame. Yeah. That was a cool, cool. Uh, I was excited about that, but. Yeah. It never happened. Yeah. So which one do you want to start with? Well, let's start with the Dark Holiday special. Okay. Yeah. So it, it, it opens. I got confused. I mean, I guess I say that a lot, don't I? But I, I when it when it <laughs> opened, I got confused uh, by the um, by where the setting, because it opened with this slaughter around a Christmas tree. And I thought, man, that's pretty dark. I thought it was like a family. Um, right. But we it, find it out, apparently is. Yeah. We found out it is like, a soup kitchen, right? Yeah, exactly. We found out later there was a sh- soup kitchen, um, right? Which is uh, still is still pretty, you know, pretty terrible. Oh, of course, yeah. yeah. But I'd like to bring up the cover first because it's got the, uh, <laughs> the the cover is made by Kevin O'Neill uh, of Martial Law fame. I don't know if anybody out there listening knows about the Martial Law comics. Oh, yeah. They're pretty cool. I'm a big fan. But uh, there's so much to look at in this cover. It's got a mm. pinhead dressed as Santa. And I, I'm surprised that nobody ever thought about turning this cover into like a, a Christmas card. And there's like a, think... a window framed by skeletons and there's these little kids out in the snow like looking in. Yeah, yeah. It seems like outside the window is like the Leviathan maze or something. Because you see like oh, these. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah and, and then there's, there's like a flaming angel out there. Yes, there I is. I guess a, that's the, oh, that's the angel on top of the tree. There's a Christmas tree there. Oh, right. You're right. Okay. Yes, absolutely. And the uh, pinhead Santa. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna mention it because it looks like he's got a, a penis hanging from his belt, a severed penis. Oh my gosh! Uh, and he's got a bloody beard that he's holding up to his face, like he ripped it off of Santa Claus. Yeah, and he's holding uh, Rudolph's bloody antlers as well. <laughs> yeah, and he's got. Oh, that's Rudolph's nose on his belt. 
with because it's oh, got I the see. red it's thing on the end of it. Okay, that's my dirty mind. I went right <laughs> okay. to the penis thing. Okay. And his, but his, yeah, and this is his, his shoulder and his his sleeve are on fire. Yep, yep. yep. And there's a kid <laughs> yeah. opening a puzzle box, like hey, just the hands in the box. Oh, and there's an alien coming out of a teddy bear. He's on fire because he's coming out of the chimney. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, he's coming through the chimney, and uh, apparently little Timmy didn't put it out. Yeah, and there's, and there's yeah, like an a- alien coming, uh, bursting out of the chest of a teddy bear. It's such a good cover. It works on so many levels. And a jack-in-the-box springing open, and there's like maggots <laughs> flying out of the box. Yeah, and don't forget that uh, Santa Pinhead has a belt buckle that reads, Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> So that puts me in the mood. That puts yeah. me in the, the Christmas mood right yeah. there. Yeah. Yep. Crazy, crazy cover. Um, yep. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. I didn't. I, th- thanks for that. I didn't really spend the time to look at it. That Ke- much. Kevin O'Neill, though, he's he, when he does like martial law and any other yeah. stuff that he does, like he always puts so many different little uh, uh, jokes in the background. He always has such such great such great uh, uh, attention to detail, even yeah. in the the cards that are Mm -hmm. sitting on top of the mantelpiece of the, of the fireplace. They're really funny to look at. You have one of them. That's got a a Rudolph with a giant red nose, uh, on the right side. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. That's so much to look at right, right there. And, uh, and the wrapping paper that, uh, little Timmy unwrapped the box. It's made out of uh, red snowflakes and green skulls. Did you see that? (laughs) Oh yeah. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, so like you said, the the opening um, is a huge massacre, right? And yeah. uh, the, the these Cenobites are there, and uh, and Atkins is saying, "I get, I bet I get blamed for this shit too." Yeah. Because um, of course, in the Devil's Brigade, Atkins was a Cenobite that just killed so many people. He made all those massacres in that story, right? Uh, especially oh, yeah, with yeah. gang wars. And he yeah. talks about how on Christmas he got blamed for something when he was a kid or something like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, because these other kids opened all the presents and he, you know, and he, but and he got blamed for it because he was the oldest. So why are they there? They, I think they're there to, they've been charged by Leviathan to solve the mystery of this unsanctioned attack. So apparently yeah. all these people have been chained, but no Cenobite actually did it. So they're there to investigate what happened and how did this yeah. happen. And, and they find some mysterious gifts under the tree, right? Yeah, so each, which it, this seems really <laughs> implausible, but it's a nice way to tie all these stories together, I guess. But the idea that you know, you think one of these toys would have been enough to <laughs> to get them all killed. Yeah, it's yeah. been a trifecta. Yeah. So the, they they find a box. Uh, this the segue into the first story is that they find a plastic box that looks like a lament configuration, but. <laughs> Balbarith is looking at her compendium of hell uh, lament configurations. She can't find it until Face points out, hmm, wait a minute. I see that the yeah. devil's mark has been sacrificed in favor of one reading made in Taiwan. So it's, yeah. and, it's and a, a toy. I, I'm glad he pointed that out because when I saw that at first, I was like, man, the artist got really lazy with that, you know, lament configuration until I read on and, you know, understood the story behind it. Yeah. And, so it the first terrible. story. Yeah. So the first story is called um, Child's Play, and it's about a a marketer that goes to hell. Yeah. And this guy is really just a scumbag. Yeah. So he apparently he opened the box and uh, he he was taken to hell. And then he gets uh, two Cenobites who are talking to him and he tries to strike a bargain. Right. He says um, he, he says something like. Uh, you know, he shouldn't have, he shouldn't have opened that box. <laughs> no one gets out, and he's like, "Well, I could be useful. You know, I, I could, uh, I, I, you know." And he the says, Cenobite you're doing, says, "You're marketing all wrong." And and um, yeah, yeah, and I could. The get Cenobite asks him if he ever dragged an innocent soul to hell. And he says, "One, I can get you thousands. You know, I'm a marketer. You know, I, I can, uh, I can uh, make sure that uh, a lot more people um, can can be, uh, you know." I can make a lot more people open boxes if I just market them right. So they, they send them back. Right. And he's going to market them for kids. Yeah. Jeez. You know, I, I'm so, surprised that these Cenobites are going along with this, but it seems like they're just also just kind of screwing around with him. 
They are. They are. Yeah. So the, this guy wakes up the next day, he's back in his apartment, and he, he tries to go to a toy uh, company, and he wants to do a focus group um, for kids to play with lament configurations. <laughs> and then, of course, the day comes for the focus group thing, and when he comes in, he discovers that <clears throat> the toys on the table, they don't look like lament configurations. They're different. They're plastic toys that they made because the guy says, oh, you know what, you know, that, that to box you gave us, if it's uh, something that already exists, you know, we can't produ mass produce it, so we just created our own right. versions we of it. We can't own like, the oh. copyright on it. Right. So he goes like, oh, no, where did you put it? Oh, it's upstairs in the office. And he goes, runs around, picks it up, runs, rushes back in, puts it on the table, and then the ki one of the kids grabs the actual box, and he goes like, hey, look at this. It's some sort of bo puzzle box or something. How lame can you get? And he just throws <laughs> it. it. Yeah. And then he picks up action figures of those two Cenobites from earlier. Yeah, yeah. And the other yeah. kid says, yeah, no kidding. That's lame, but these are fresh. Yeah. <laughs> and as it turns out, uh, the Cenobites were just screwing with him. Um, yeah. And they actually are the ones who put those action figures of themselves in the in the focus group uh, room. And they just open up the they open up the wall and they show up behind the marketer and said, ha ha, you you didn't think of, uh, you know, you should have you should have realized uh, that you have to always watch out for the competition. So yeah. basically, they never expected him to succeed. They they were like sabotaging him so they could bring him back to hell. And there's so. a nice callback here to the Hellbound Heart because only this guy can see uh, can see those two Cenobites and nobody else can. Oh which yeah, I, I good... thought was kind of cool because you don't that you don't really see that often in in the Hellraiser comics or movies. Yeah, usually when they show up, you know they everybody goes crazy and you know, yeah. And here only he can watch them, can see yeah. them. So that's um, yeah, and then Atkins uh, Atkins kind of blows up the plastic box. I mean, these these <laughs> stories, I get the idea that who's flashbacking these stories. I mean, I can't <laughs> no. really tell. No, I know. Right? Is it her? Is, does she figure it all out just by looking in her book? I guess. Yeah, it's right? like, is it a vision that they take out yeah. of the box when they like touch it or something? Yeah. I don't know because we don't really. It just cuts back and forth between. Yeah. The Cenobites at the massacre room, and then it just gives us a story for every single item that they're going to pick up. Well, and those made in Taiwan things are fake. They shouldn't be able to do anything, right? And him blowing it up with his gun, it's kind of like, who cares? That That's a good point, yeah. Um, right. <laughs> so he destroys it, and then the next thing is they find a little statue that's supposed to be a golem. Yeah. And that... That kind of segs into uh, a pretty good story. I really enjoy the story. Yeah. I can't read the title. Yeah, I was wondering if the title is called Golem. It's in Hebrew, and it could be. Yeah, that's a that's a good or catch Yiddish, there. Yeah, I guess right. A Hebrew, yeah. Yeah. Let me check that really quickly. Okay. Because it's written in the Hebrew uh, alphabet, so yeah. I have it right here. Yes, you're correct. Oh, it does yeah. say Golem. I can take the question mark off of my our show notes. I think it does because I just uh, yeah. I just looked at Golem into Hebrew, and it's very similar, even though the last the last thing is kind of different. But I don't know if that's oh. just because of the alliteration. But uh, yeah, so this was a really cool story. Um, it's written by let's see who wrote this. Oh, I, we don't I, have the yeah. Uh, I couldn't tell the the copy that we have doesn't doesn't say the. Doesn't give right. Credit. Anyway, so <clears throat> there's this mythology, right, about the golem and uh, and Jewish culture that yeah. it was something that you would create out of clay and then you just write this uh, special um, the the real name of God and put it on yeah. a paper and in, inside of the golem and the golem's mouth and the golem would come to life and it would protect the the, the Jewish people. So yeah. that's something that they would a little story they would tell children, I guess. Um, yeah. So it opens up with a couple of they look like Hasidic Jews or Orthodox Jews. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and it's in Albany. Got the, the the long um curly sideburns and yeah. yeah. It seems like most of these stories that we're going to read uh especially for this one, they all take place in New York or whereabouts. Yeah. Right? Cuz this one is in Albany. And then there, I think there's another one that takes place in the Bronx. Um, yeah. Or that's the other one. That's the other special. But a lot of these stories end up in New York somehow. So <laughs> they're pretty New York-centric. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, this kid, uh, his dad tells him about 
he he takes something out of a, a closet, a cupboard, and he, he shows him a Hellraiser box, right? Yeah. Yeah, and it's like it's been in the family, and, you know, you, you never play with it. You just protect it. Kind of right, because there's uh, demons live in the box. Shadim. And um, the last time uh, one of one of uh, their family relatives opened the box, their screams were heard for for years in the night. So he just disappeared, was taken by demons. And so, yeah, the kid is saying, you know, so we're living here in New York and people don't like us. And there's like the bunt, which was um, the bunt was, uh, you know, people were meeting in America and they were kind of supportive of Hitler and the Nazi party. Yeah. And um, and so he says they're starting to they don't like us here as well. So is there anything is God going to protect us? And so, you know, that that's basically what they're. Uh, yeah. Jeez. Yeah. I mean, th- th- this is uh, this is relevant to today, unfortunately. Yeah. So it cuts to this uh, beer house, right? This this beer brewery place where uh, some people are organizing a, a bunt and they're uh, there. Th- there's a lot of he- Hebrew slurs in this in this conversation here. Yeah. <laughs> and so they see the. They see the two kids, uh, Jacob and his father, in a wagon outside of the brewery, and they they say, you know, oh look, there's Jewish people outside, and um, there's this one kid called Bill, and they're trying to get him to join the bunt, and they're saying, you know, Here you, you, you should, uh, yeah. They give him a rock to throw at the Jewish people, and and he throws it, and accidentally, well, not accidentally, he throws it, so he, he hits the Jacob's father in the head, and he falls down from the wagon, and he dies. Yeah. Uh, right. So, and the cops come and they're like, well, there's nothing we can do, kid. You know, they have alibis and until we get some proof, there's nothing we can do. Uh, I really like your old man. He could turn a buck out of that junk faster than anybody. I'm really yeah. sorry, kid. <laughs> so, yeah, the kid is like, oh, yeah, well, they're all going to pay. I'm going to get that box and yeah. I'm going to bring out the golem. The golem is going to protect the Jews. I'm done waiting for God. Yeah. So he. Which he grabs the box, and at that at that point, I got a little confused because it doesn't seem like the golem's doing anything, right? I mean, he grabs the box, and it and there's like lightning coming out of it and stuff into the golem, but then he just goes around knifing people. The kid does. Yeah, but the first time, the the first time that uh, that it happens. So there's one guy being thrown out of the brewery at night. I guess he was drunk or something. Yeah. And and they just we just see the bouncer and the drunk guy. And then all of a sudden we see someone with a knife. Yeah. But it's like this kid is a kid. He's like he's smaller. And we get this angle from above. And we get the people looking back and being surprised. And we're like, oh, oh. oh. And it, how would a kid be able to kill both the bouncer and the drunk guy? Um, it, it doesn't seem like – and also the guy's looking up. So it seems like that whatever kills them – is taller than they are. But why so, would it, but why would the golem be carrying a knife? I mean, he could just kill them with his bare hands. Right. So I thought it's it was a little the confusing. Kid. I thought it was the kid yeah. the whole time. It is confusing. You know, in, it in, is. in an otherwise great story, this this mm-hmm. part kind of I you know, I was a head scratcher. It was a head scratcher, but I think you're right. I think it was the kid. He was just knifing people um you know, he was just catching them by surprise. But that the way they framed it for the first series of for the first couple of murders seems like it was something taller than they were. Yeah. And that made it confusing. But then Billy's coming out of the bunt meeting one day and he's still talking to the old, you know, the other guy, the the other Nazi guy. And is uh, he's just saying, you know, hey, Billy, don't worry about it. It was just a Jew. The cops are not going to care about an old Jew. Yeah. Uh, and he's he's got conscious problems, right? Bill's got conscious issues. He's like, oh, I well, don't know, man. I. It seems like he's only afraid that he's going to get in trouble. I don't think. Right. That, I I don't know how much of a conscience this kid even has about it. Right. Anyway, so <clears throat> as soon as the other guy leaves, then Jacob shows up behind Bill and says, oh yeah, well you know, uh, you're going to get what you deserve. You're not going to go home to your dad. You're going to get what you deserve. And so basically it's, it's little Jacob, he's got a knife and he's, he's gone kind of blood crazy and he kind of stabs him repeatedly and he leaves him to die. Yeah. And then he goes back to his house and he's talking to the golem figure. The, I, I, I don't understand what that golem figure was supposed to be. I, I think it was yeah. just something that his dad had in the house. Yeah. And it, like you said, I don't think he ever really opened the box. Um, and the golem, just, 
it's questionable if the bolt golem came to life or not. It is questionable. And so, and then the kid is talking to the box and he's trying to open it and he's saying that he'll get them all. And then all of a sudden we see the cops uh, and they show up and they say, Jacob, you know, put down the knife. Everything's going to be all right. And I had another confusing moment because I thought he was in his house, right? Oh, because the golem was like up on the roof, I think. Oh, was he? Okay. But yeah, but they wouldn't pull up cars on the roof. Right, of course. So, so, so I don't know. Yeah, it is confusing. And this also looks like it takes place in, in like the 50s, those based mm -hmm. on those police cars. Right, it does, yeah. It says here Albany 1930-something in oh, the beginning. Okay. Yeah, okay. so it says Albany 1938, so it's before oh. World War II, right? Okay, so these are Nazi sympathizers. Yeah, they they were the the people meeting in the brewery. Mm -hmm. Um, so the the cops end up killing Jacob because he's holding a knife and he's holding the box, and then they say, "Oh, if only he'd waited a, a little more before taking his revenge, because we had a sworn statement from a guy from the neighborhood, and we would have yeah. caught the people who killed his dad." And then I think that we're supposed to see this last couple of panels kind of wraps everything up a little too fast. It's like. The guy who was organizing the bunt, you know, the Nazi guy, mm -hmm. the Nazi sympathizer, we see him grab the box from the floor by the dead mm -hmm. body of Jacob, and he immediately picks it up, and you see sparks coming out of it. Yeah. And what's implied is that this guy's going to open the box, and he's going to be taken to hell. Yeah, which is like, Seems, okay, but yeah, you, they could have shown it then. You know, take, yeah, and taking then, one more page to do that. I know, right? It seems like they just wrapped the story up too quickly and it's like yeah. gets a little confusing that's the only problem with these short anthology stories is that sometimes you wish they have a little more time well and to, yeah yeah the, the, my other problem with these anthology stories is that the uh the the link between the the you know the christmas setting or whatever and then the story is really really stretched thin i mean especially mm -hmm. in this one they found some little golem toy under the tree. What does that got to do with this story? I mean, almost nothing. Right. I guess it was supposed to be, I don't know, something that someone <laughs> created with some sort of hellish power, and yeah. it ended up uh, ended up uh, releasing these chains and killed all these people. But we don't really understand what's the connection. Yeah. Who made it? Uh, if this story takes place in 38, is that still from 1938? Who yeah. made that thing? And then there's a somebody, so, there's a dead person with a dreidel in their hand. And it's like, what's that? Got, you know, it's like just because somebody was Jewish there, that has something to do with this story? Maybe. And also because Atkins is talking about balancing and that, that the situation is all unbalanced and then they show a dreidel. I guess yeah. that's their... So they're trying to symbolize the, you know, balancing things on a dreidel. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, so the next thing that they find is a book of riddles. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. And or or uh, fairy tales or Yeah, or nursery, nursery rhymes. rhymes. Yeah. I like this story. I think this was maybe the best story. Yeah. Because they actually we actually see someone try to solve a puzzle and they actually make sense when they solve it and yeah and, and you see them investigating it and working really hard at it and it's it's um, it, it's a little bit like wordsworth like this the solving of this puzzle is sort of the way of opening this gate to hell or you know contributing you know then you start to find out that the solution to the problem the to the puzzle is you know you're now you're in hell yeah yeah, yeah that's it, right really cool. right you made a really good connection there so this takes place, it's called Nursery Crime, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> kind of a hokey title, yeah. Nursery Crime, and it takes place in Oxford, England, and um, yeah, so there's this one guy, I think his name is, is, is he Edward? Yeah. Charles. No, yeah, and uh, they, right from the bat, they, they, they try to make sure you understand that this is not a sympathetic character. He's, no. uh, he hates his son and he resents him. And he's like, I told you I didn't want to have kids. It's like, well, isn't it also partly your fault too, dude? Right. Right. Yeah. And he, hey, and just... he hits his wife too, right? Like she had bruises on her arm. Yeah. Yeah. He's not a sympathetic character at all. The little boy is called Charles. And I think this, this guy is called Edward or something. Let me see. Was it Edward? I don't know. But anyway, so. Yeah, this guy wanted to be um, – he's a professor of British folklore, and he didn't want kids. So he 
I think he. It's implied he ended up having to marry his, the, his wife because she got pregnant and he thought she was barren. And he just trash talks her and his kid right right to their faces. And it's just yeah. a terrible character, right? Yeah. He calls his wife an old sow in front of the the kid and all that. It's just like, oh, my God, this guy's yeah. terrible. This guy's a horrible, horrible person. Yeah. But he's obsessed with getting some sort of recognition in his career. And he's so and, self-important that he thinks like, oh, you're just going to get in my way. And you're just, you know, and, and I don't yeah. know. He just he's so arrogant. Very self-absorbed. Yeah. Um, Hey, the little kid in this story kind of reminds me of Joey, by the way. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> when he was younger, I guess. Yeah, well, uh, he, his all of his questions and asking you to do the same thing over and over again, is, so that's a little bit like him, too. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so this guy found a book in in, uh, in an old shop, and he discovered what may be an un... Uh, un um, what do you call it? Unidentified nursery rhyme that nobody's ever found before. Yeah. Yeah, and it's so, a cool nursery rhyme. I mean, uh, cheers to the writers, and I wish I knew who they were because it's we don't have the credits for this. Yeah, so but, it's uh, the crows fly to London town. Um, the crows fly down to London town, their wings as black as day. The ladies sing in dressing gowns to chase the moon away. Oh, give me please a farthing, sir. Oh, give me please your pay. You cannot spend your money. Sir, the crows right, are here to stay. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so the kid is always saying, hey, daddy, explain to me what this means. Like, you know, mm -hmm. and he's trying to analyze the the rhyme. And like you said, he finds out that it may be an un, un, uh, unidentified nursery rhyme. The, the thing that I didn't understand in this story is, is, is this kid pushing him to solve this nursery rhyme. Is he is this kid complicit, complicit with Leviathan in hell from the start or only like later on? Yeah, that's a good question. I would say later on, yeah, because I think that would be a really long, long con for Leviathan to actually like give yeah. him a child. But even he does say the wife was supposed to be barren, and she does mention that this was the kid was a miracle. Um, oh, that's right. You know, uh, Lord's doing, not mine. That she got pregnant. So it could be that Leviathan gave him this child as a yeah. way to ensnare him right oh, well then i wonder if this was written by dg chichester since he uh, no. seems to love all, all of his stories involve like some kid you know right, being impregnated right. into somebody against their will or whatever anyway so so he he is doing his research and every day the kid wants to know have you find out what the poem means and so he's like oh wow and we see this this whole analysis that he's doing like uh talking about analyzing what a farthing was and it was a cent and by the 19th century it was practically worthless you know even half pennies weren't written about any anymore by then so yeah. he's trying to figure out analyzing like verse by verse what it means and yeah. you know it, but the book was published really... much later when the when when a farthing would have been useless and yeah and so he gets so obsessed he has a dream about the poem and he sees this dark figure it looks like a plague doctor, right, with the, yeah. the, the glasses and the big beak mask and stuff. And he he wakes up and he uh, he goes to to class and he he talks to one of his colleagues and say, "Hey, have you ever seen this figure before? I saw it in a dream." And he says, "Oh yeah, this is a plague doctor uh, during the plague of London. You know, they wore these masks, you know, and and they would actually fill the masks with like these herbs and these like things to filter out the smell. And they thought it would also filter out the viruses of, of the disease. Mm. So that would keep them from getting infected. But yeah, he tells, he tells him about the, the London plague and then he's like, Oh yeah, that makes sense. So he, th he thinks the crows are the plague doctors and that the singing ladies are actually wailing widows. And he's like, Oh, I think I figured out the puzzle. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And yeah. So he goes out and he gets totally drunk and he comes home. And then when he gets home, he finds his family in a very particular situation. Yeah, yeah. So um, he had, uh, I think the, 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 the Cenobites were there, right? The, um, the crow right, he and, gets and home. Moonface are there he with, gets, with his Yeah, kid. he gets home and his wife is catatonic and his kid is like sitting in the center of a circle of candles. And he says, hey, dad, did you find out the puzzle? And, and he says, oh, you, you figured out the puzzle, daddy. That makes me so happy. 
And here, here are my new friends, Crow and Moonface. Yeah. And uh, what what happens is that, of course, his dad is taken to hell, and uh, he becomes the son in a weird Teletubbies from hell kind of landscape. <laughs> yeah. Right? He's got this big old, like, boil on his head, too, like he's got the plague. Yeah, and so... And then we get, we're given the second stanza of the rhyme in hell. It says, The man in the moon, he died too soon, all on a summer's day. The man in the sun, he rose for his son. He's with us now to stay, Leviathan. Yeah. So that's cool. Yeah. So, yeah, he solved the puzzle and he was taken to hell. Yeah. That's really, really cool. I like the way that this landscape at the end is kind of a hellish version of his dream. Yeah, yeah. It's really it's really creepy and weird. It, and it, it's not exactly, you know hellraiser ish but it's it's really cool yeah i thought it was a very good story yeah uh so face is starting starting to destroy like they seem to be destroying all of these oh, artifacts he's, he starts ripping pages out of the book out of the yeah. nursery rhyme book so he's calling this vaudevillian sideshow mentality street performance trash it's no shakespeare and he's just ripping the book page yeah. by page until balbarith has to like whack him with a book yeah to get him out of it and um, and then the they they talk about what to do, right? They talk about well, this um, these puzzles were created, and the the obsessions of these puzzles ended up giving them some sort of power, and uh, it created this sort of critical mass, and uh, it ended up exploding in like this infernal thing that I guess it's nobody's fault. It's just like these objects were accumulated this kind of psychic energy or infernal energy and they'd ended up exploding into like this room of chains right well and and one of them i think was it uh face i think so or one of them pointed out something about that last story that i thought was interesting he's like seems like that kid is just as much at fault as the as the as the adult Mm -hmm. and it's like yeah "Yeah, actually that's how come he didn't get taken to hell it's like yeah actually that's a good good point he pushed him into into solving that Although I don't yeah. think he needed to. Right. You know, I think it would have come out exactly the same if the kid hadn't been pushing him to solve it. Yeah. So they say that the, the obsessions and the, the ideas behind these artifacts created the critical mass that ended up, you know, uh, exploding into this room of chains. And so... So it's nobody's fault. It's nobody's fault. And Atkins has a special grenade that can... <laughs> destroy <laughs> these artifacts and make everything right again. Yeah. So he takes out this grenade. It looks like a little skull. And uh, he said, let's blow these puzzles straight to hell. So they put her over there and they all put their hands on a tiny detonator. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. And, and it explodes. And it reminds me of the scene when Pinhead closes the, the box at the beginning of Hellraiser. Yeah. And yeah. the whole room of chains and, and, and Frank's remains all disappear. Right, yeah, so there's no evidence left. So there's no evidence. And right, then there's actually, just a line, light shining through the window, but it's not like the building actually explodes. Yeah, and so everybody in the room is back to life somehow. It looks like they they corrected the timeline or something, and yeah. they took those puzzles out of it. And all the people inside the that soup kitchen are just having fun, and one of them just kind of mentions, hey, I think there were a few more packages under the tree, weren't they? And it's like, eh, it's okay. If there's some things missing, no one's the worse for it. So, and, and then we see the, the fireplace has a burning card there that says, bloody peace on earth, strong will to men. And there's and face. Peace, peace is spelled like piece of, you know, like a piece of like, cheese or, you know, not like, yeah, yeah. not like peace, P-E-A-C. It's P-I-E-C-E, peace on earth. It's, it's a bad pun. It's a yeah. really bad pun. You go in pieces. Yeah, yeah. So we see the Cenobites there, and they're all like saying, "Strong will to men, bloody peace on earth." Yeah. The end. So they yeah. all fixed everything, and um, yeah, it was it was fun. I mean, it's yeah. just a the 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 bookend story is kind of weak, but yeah. I think it's got some strong stories into it, especially the Golem one. I thought it was interesting, a little confusing, but then the last one, the the nursery crime I thought was the best story of the bunch. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I liked, I, I did like all the stories, but I thought the interconnecting like Christmas, you know, anthology thing was, was weak. Yeah. But, uh, but I liked the story, the three stories. 
But, you know, Child's Play the least. I think I liked Golem and Nursery Crime the best. And the explanation for what happened there and, and why those three artifacts kind of created that uh, explosion of chains was kind of weak, too. I mean, yeah. Eh. So, oh, yeah. yeah, they created a critical mass, blah, 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 psychic energy, hell. Mm -hmm. It's like, ah, OK, so it's, it's nobody's fault. It's like the Simpsons Halloween specials. Like at the beginning, they had to come up with ways to tie all those stories together. And they just kept on they just kept on kind of fudging that until eventually they just quit you know, having the scenes of them all sitting around at the house telling stories and they just went straight into the stories and just gave up on. Yeah. They would just make them. like, yeah, they would just make little themes for the skits and just play them as different segments. So yeah. I think that would have been the best approach for this. Yeah. But, right. They know. didn't need to tie them together. They could have made one extra story and just made like an anthology for like, you know, the holiday special. So yeah. that would have worked out better. Yeah. And then we're in the summer special, uh, which has a crazy like teenager with hooks all over him. And yeah, is that his hair that's like splayed out on the gr like he's laying down on the ground? Or is that like is his head exploding? No, it looks like his hair. His hair okay. is just like all spiked out uh, yeah. going in all directions. Okay. Very, very impressive looking piece um, for yeah. this cover, I think. Very, very nice. Yeah. And it's it's the, the theme is like, what did you do on your summer vacation? And this is another one of those where anthologies where there's people sitting around telling stories that don't really like, why do you know this story? Or how, well, why, this is not what happened on your summer vacation because this was like in the <laughs> 60s or whatever. Right. But yeah. I think the bookend story for this one is actually better than the one we just read. It's about a group of children at a Catholic school who are tormenting a nun. I think her name is Sister Mary Frances. Yeah. They took until her, she runs out of the school. They took yeah. her wig and like threw it up on top of the um, on top of the light or something in the, yeah. in the classroom. So they get a new substitute teacher. And I think her name is Mrs. Neal, yeah. who asks them as a way of introduction. So what did you do on your summer vacation? Yeah. And uh, as each child goes through their story, I guess we, we see that they're all somehow connected to hell in some way or other. Except these kids don't tell stories that involve them at all. I mean, except for the last one. I, the first one kind of does, I, I thought. Um, the first one, I think, is kind of connected to it because he's got... He's got those so lines there's, on his face. Yeah, there's one kid and um, what's his name? Joey. Yeah, so there's this kid, Joey, and he's kind of a shy kid. And it looks like he's been drawing or doodling on his own face with yeah. a pen. And then he tells a story, and the story is called Baby Cakes. Yeah, so, um, and it's totally not appropriate for a kid to be telling this story in class. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's written by Faye Perazic, um, and it was illustrated by Jerry Talak. Yeah. So it's about, about a woman whose most fervent desire is to have a child of her own, regardless of the cost, right? So she's yeah. barren. She's single and she doesn't have money to adopt. So she tries hell. Seems like a yeah, kind of an extreme leap yeah, there, but you know, let's roll with it. There should be some some more steps in between there, but yeah. And I I thought it was funny and uh, interesting that the Cenobite in this story is the same character from um, book 2's The Threshold story. Uh, oh, Leo yeah, Marx. Yeah. He's the creator of the Dreamweaver cube. So uh, in that story, he donated the plans to the computer to Amtech, and then he solved the puzzle cube, was taken to hell, and was made into a Cenobite. So I guess we'll call him Leo because that's his name. So this woman opens the box, right? She asks for a child, and he takes her to hell where she stays there for nine months. Yeah, um, right. And then she doesn't just have one baby. She just keeps on getting pregnant and having babies. Yeah, when the child when the first child is born, it's covered in symbols and sigils, and she's told that it's it's both the baby and the lament configuration, and they shall open the doorway to a new realm in hell. Yeah, and uh, like you said, she becomes a birthing slave in Leviathan's hell for this new army, um, against her will. You know, yeah. being impregnated by these monsters to make these monster babies, and I ain't yeah. talking about Lady Gaga being the mama monster here. <laughs> right. And so these, yeah, and these babies are, um, each one of them is like a configuration of its own that can open a portal to hell, which that was a, that was a plot for the Jihad series, right? And that was, and that got Elastor in trouble with Leviathan. He oh, wasn't supposed right. to do that. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, like but now, uh, this guy, this guy, this like studly Cenobite dude, you know, is doing it like a whole bunch of times, and I don't. He doesn't seem to be getting in trouble. He also uh, these babies come out and they're kind of malleable, or we'll just we'll just say that the Cenobite has these weird powers to manipulate flesh, and he kind of yeah. he twists the babies up, and then he like stretches their faces, and he pulls up their eyes, and he turns them into little freaks. And, um, and yeah, they, it's, and they it's very also disturbing. Grow up super fast, right? I think they get really big. Um, I didn't see that. I just, I just see that there's a monster that comes in, but I don't think that's supposed to be one of those babies. Oh, okay, is it? maybe I misunderstood. I thought that was the same baby. Yeah. So she stays in eternity, having babies one after the other for nine months at a time, and says, "Then she had plenty of time, all the time in hell." Yeah. Yeah, so the teacher is getting very, very disturbed um, with these yeah. stories. Yeah, boy, uh, that shows her for wanting to have a baby. Yeah, so she's she's she tries to switch the the theme to what happened to Sister Frances's wig, and then there's a little girl called Anne. She wants to talk about her summer vacation, right? Yeah, and this one also, to me, I don't understand how this how she knows this story or how it involves her or her summer vacation because it starts out. In like the sixties, I have a theory about that, but I'm going to save that to to the end after okay. we talk about all the stories. Okay, that's but yeah, good. so yeah, she, her story goes to summer of 1966 near Marseille, and uh, it's called The Devil's Absolution, written by R. J. M. L'Officier, and illustrated by George Zafino, right, who we've seen before in the anthology yeah. series. Yeah, he he made that story about that. Uh, banana republic dictator right. and he has this this political prisoner and he keeps giving them like lament configurations and there's one of them that says i'm not going to open that and he just kills him beats him to death with his stick and then the yeah box opens up and takes him to hell I, so I there's like, this i like the art and i and i like this character of her father i mean even though he starts out kind of a murderous guy i think he's uh you get to like his his character he's interesting He's an old school gangster living on a house by a cliff in the Marseille yes. coast, and uh, he rules his crime and blood family with an iron hand. He's the grandfather of this girl. He's the he's the grandfather. Yeah. Um, so she, a little girl called Anne, same name as the girl in the school uh, class, she witnesses uh, one day her granddad murder a bunch of people, uh, or at least one guy. Yeah, because the guy uh, was questioning him and saying that he's too old-fashioned and they should be able to sell drugs. And Yeah, but then she realizes her granddad is a kingpin of crime, and this is going to affect her deeply as she grows up. Uh, then the story kind of moves to Malibu, California in the 90s, where Anne is now part of a secret society of affluent occultists, right, who uh, yeah. perform human sacrifices and parties by summoning the Cenobite called Wormface. But she doesn't re she doesn't know, right? I don't think she knows that that's what they do until her until this one party. Oh, she's she's one of the main people. She's like oh, their really? uh, leading lady. Yeah, she's their leading lady when they uh, they're in the process of offering that blonde Texan girl at the ritual, yeah. mm -hmm. and she's one of the girls who kind of brings this like thing, right? She has this like symbol, metal thing, or medallion, or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. But do you think so, that she believed that this was going to happen or she'd done it before? I think so. Okay. She was into it. I she was in I it. I didn't understand it that way. I thought maybe they were just trying something, but they didn't know what would happen. Yeah, she's the one who says, they await you, master. Make ready the lamb. That's her. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So she... So Wormface, what he does is when he comes, he takes the victim's uh, head... Right. And he uh, he pulls her head out and he leaves, which kind of doesn't make a lot of sense for the Cenobites. Yeah, because Cenobites, usually that's not how they operate. But, you know, whatever. It's yeah, kind of like I mean, this weird occult thing. There's a lot of freedom in these stories and, and a lot yeah. of really weird Cenobites. Yeah. But when you see that um, worm face takes the victim's head off and someone stabs them in the in the stomach and just like she did those years ago at her doll when she saw a man being murdered. Did you notice yeah. that? Yeah, right, right. Like her doll, she kind of stabbed the doll and pulled her head out when her granddad finds her after she saw the murder. And then yeah. here, after they summon Wormface, the the sacrifice is left with a knife on its t stomach and a 
had taken off. So yeah. I thought that was an interesting thing. Um, so what happens is someone goes to tell her granddad that her little granddaughter is in danger. She's running around with bad people and he goes to see what's going on. He goes alone to set her straight. Right. Mm -hmm. So he shows up during a ritual where she was to become the offering. Right. There's like, oh, this woman is now going to be my new leading lady. We're going to turn the tables on you. We're going to offer you as a ritual yeah, sacrifice. Says, what? No. Yeah. And her granddad appears with a gun and he starts shooting up the place. And um, and he kills like the the main the main guy and he kills like all people who oppose him. And then he talks to Wormface and he says, you're not taking my Pishun. And he says, well, uh, then I'm going to take you instead of her. And he says, yeah. no, you're not. And he just shoots up the Cenobite and leaves. <laughs> yeah, right. He shoots up Wormface. Yeah, yeah and get it's, the, it's uh, funny that Wormface just lets him get away with that. Right. But when they leave, he also takes the box. And he's like, oh, oh, look at this. I took the box. I didn't even realize I took it. Yeah. So after that, his granddaughter keeps getting these nightmares every night. And he knows what's going on. She's haunted. And the only way she can be rescued is, you know, he opens the box to talk to the Cenobite. And, uh, and he says, well, I, I was waiting for you. And he's like, okay, well... Is I want to I want my granddaughter to you know to, to be free of this like nightmares. influence yeah yeah nightmares she doesn't belong with you and um, so he's like okay well we're gonna take you with me and you're gonna obey hell and he says I will not <laughs> yeah I know yeah, yeah it's yeah it's funny he's like you will obey I will not and then that was kind of the end of that discussion right yeah I like the the way the worm face talks he's there's one line where he says, you shall let Leviathan's glory set your heart afire. You yeah. shall learn the true delight that cannot rot. You shall obey. And he says, I will not. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, so Anne comes in and all the other gangsters, they come in and they find that the room is empty. Their grandpappy disappeared and the box is left behind. And it, it hints that she kind of lost her mind when she saw that, right? Yeah. Because she just uh, starts playing that song that she played when she was a little girl, yeah. Alouette. And I looked up the meaning of Alouette, and uh, the lyrics are uh, interesting. Um, because they're talking about plucking the feathers off a lark. Oh. Yeah, it says, I will pluck your head, I will pluck your tummy, I will pluck your neck. And it's kind of a weird sto weird song, right? I mean, you're wow. plucking the feathers off a bird. Wow. Uh, I had no yeah. idea. I've heard the song before, but I never knew what the words meant. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of creepy. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to pluck your wings. I'm going to pluck your head. I'm going to pluck your whatever. So wow. poor Lark. I think this is yeah. kind of, I was looking up the meaning of it and I found out a Wikipedia page with the lyrics and what they're supposed to mean. And the Lark is supposed to be the bird of the morning. So she's the bird that wakes the lovers up. And that's probably why they're plucking <laughs> the bird. It's like, hey, I, I don't want the morning to come just now. I want to stay with my lover. Oh, so I'm going to pluck the wings off this bird so it can't wake me up anymore. You know, that, there's all sorts of meanings that can be behind hmm. that. So. so, yeah, the teachers just keeps getting more and more concerned about these kids. And they're <laughs> the next. Yeah, next and, there's a little boy, right, called and, Ernest. And there's an overhead shot where you can see on the light fixture, like you can see the wig. Um, there's a little overhead uh, panel there where you can see the wig on top of a light fixture there. It looks like it's got maggots in it or worms. Yeah, and then we find out that there were hooks, right? Yeah, yeah, interesting. And she keeps saying, who else is willing to share with the class? Maybe about sister's hair. Yeah. And everybody's like, me, me. And she's like, okay, well... How about you, Mr. Little Ernesto? Let's uh, you just moved here from Central America. Let's let's see if the other boys would like to learn something about where you come from. And yeah. he's like, OK. And then it goes to the South Bronx, New York City. So yeah. it doesn't really go into Central America at all. But no. And, and this one, this was a sad story. Yeah, it's very sad. <clears throat> For my son, it was called. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so you got a, uh, you've got a, a, a sweatshop worker from Central America and his son, and they don't have any money for food. He's like, you just go to sleep, and when you wake up, you'll get to eat breakfast at school. 
Yeah, that's that's very, very, very sad. So they're in the U.S. escaping violence from El Salvador, from militias that would kill anyone who talked against the president. And there's a mention here of the murder of uh, Jesuits in El Salvador, and that actually yeah. happened. That actually was something that happened six people uh, during the Salvadoran Civil War in 1989. Uh, the Salvadoran army killed six Jesuits and two others at a residence in the campus of Jose Simeon Caña Central American University. Wow. Um, the Jesuits were the advocates of a negotiated settlement between the government of El Salvador and the National Liberation Front. So there was a guerrilla organization that was fighting the government. So they just went in and killed them. Um, so that's that's kind of what caused international pressure for a ceasefire. Anyway, so these, th these two, uh, father and son, are living in the... Um, the South Bronx, and like you said, the dad is working at a uh, sweatshop and uh, run by a guy called Mr. Lee. Mm -hmm. And he's a he's a terrible boss, right? He's a bully and a thief. He works them to the bone, and he threatens everyone with the immigration whenever there's a problem. He right. doesn't really care about his employees. Even though he would get in trouble, you know, if, yeah. if, if he turned them in. Yeah. So he's working nine hours a day, two dollars an hour, and he can't – he yeah. just can't resort to begging because he, he would feel so humiliated – and his son saw him begging once, and he, he just cannot deal with the, the look in his son's eye when he yeah. saw his father begging on the street. So he would rather sell his soul to the devil, yeah. foreshadowing. Yeah, yeah. So, and he, but he ends up, does he actually? I mean, it, it seems like. No, what he does is one day he saves enough money to give his son a dinner and a phone call to a refugee line which he's hoping is not going to be the immigration in disguise. Yeah. But uh, that day while he's doing so, he's doing it from across the street where he works, and he sees across the street the sweatshop is being raided by the immigration officers. I guess now it would be raided by ICE. Mm -hmm. um, and Mr. Lee is there, and he's saying, you know, uh, hey, why are you guys bothering me? I'm just an entrepreneur. Hey, that guy, that guy's an illegal. Go get him. So he yeah. just runs away. Ernesto's father runs away, goes into the subway, trips down the stairs, accidentally pushes a mother and a child onto a train. And he's yeah. so horrified that he just jumps into the tunnel and, and runs into the tunnel to escape. Yeah. And he ends up uh, with a narrow escape from a train by just hiding into a nuke on the wall. And uh, lo and behold, behind him there's a door, and he goes into it. <laughs> yeah. And, of course, he gets lost in the maze of tunnels. And you yeah. know where this is going, right? <laughs> right, yeah. So so all, all paths in the maze lead to a diamond in the middle of the map, which, you know, we all know what that means. Yep. And it, it cuts a year later. Um, it cuts to a year later where Ernest is safe. He has a foster family. And it's being narrated by his dad, like, yeah, I, I can't see my son that much anymore now, but he's fine. He's doing okay at school. But um, And they say but yeah, it but, wouldn't be best for him to visit me. You know, it's kind of implying right. that he's in hell. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, one day we see little Ernesto coming over to Mr. Lee's sweatshop. And uh, he's like, oh, no, Mr. Lee, I'm a customer. I have something for my family from Colombia. Yeah. We'd like to make these special jackets with tubing in the back. So, yeah. And he gives them this this pattern that needs to be put on the jackets. And it's kind of a puzzling pattern. Again, hint, hint. Yeah. So Mr. Lee solves how to make this pattern that it has to be like a continuous thing and has to thread this tubing into the jacket. And he's like, these freaking coke heads, you know, and maybe I should just, you know, report them to the DEA's office. And, um, but he goes to work and he figures out the puzzle and of course he pays the price. As soon as he opens the puzzle, Ernesto's dad is now a Cenobite and um, he tortures Mr. Lee until he's just like a big puddle on the floor with a face. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Which I guess that's uh, oh, and then and then Ernesto and his dad right are there together at the end and uh, yeah, his dad has a sewing machine for a head. <laughs> Yeah, is that what he is? Yeah. I for a moment I thought he looked like a like a train. Yeah, he's even got a spindle with a with the thread on the top of his head there. That's right. And all this time I thought he looked kind of like a train, and now I realize he does look like a sewing machine. Holy cow! And he's got um and his his arms with these long fing two prong fingers looks like like needles. Yeah, or those things that you use to pull out uh, stitches. 
Ah, right. Okay. I used to call him Mr. Conductor. I thought his head looked like a a train's head and the little chimney coming out of his top, but that's not a chimney. That's like you, like you said, like that's supposed to be the line spindle, right? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. This is, this is more like a sewing machine, but it's a cool design. I mean, it sounds stupid when you say it, but it's a really cool looking uh, design for the Cenobite. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, this was all a trap that, uh, Ernesto's dad and Ernesto had pulled on Mr. Lee just so they could get revenge. Yeah. And then it cuts back to the school uh, classroom where the little Ernesto is saying, on that summer, my daddy would say, Ernesto, this season is going to be as hot as, and it's like, all right, we can, we can, we can see what your dad was going to use as comparison. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And then the teacher is very disturbed and horrified at finding out that the children are playing with scary puzzles. Right. Yeah. Oh, and and um, going back, you said you had a theory about that other story, and yeah. the the, uh, the um the devil's absolution and and the the the, the gangster and stuff about how it right. was related to this girl in the classroom. Sure. Um, so my theory is that these are the kids in kid form, uh, and even the kid that was born in like the '60s or whatever. These are all now in hell. They're just like in children form because they're all dead and this is in hell. Oh, okay. That's well, my theory. And uh, they do say something, something like that, right at the, at the end of the book in their little teaser blurb. Right. Right. Yeah. We'll get to okay. that. There's uh, cause they all have the same names as the characters in the stories. Right. And for the next one, she actually is a little girl in the story. Yeah. Uh, old wives tale. Uh, written by Barry Dutter and artist Steve Johnson, Stephen Johnson, who worked in the Hellraiser three adaptation, correct? Yeah, yeah, and and it's it's nice art, you know. It's a it's yeah, a, and and this is a good story, but it, it's kind of a, it's a little. I think it's a little bit of a stretch to say that all these old wives' tales and scary story, you know, stories to scare children somehow help Leviathan keep maintain order. Yeah, uh, I I don't I don't see it. But but that's yeah. okay. I still like this story anyway. It's just a way of saying that Leviathan wanted to control people with fear, I guess. Yeah. And his children are very malleable to this sort of thing. So, you know, there's things that you learn when you're a kid that you carry on to adulthood. And even then, after you know that it's not true, you still learn those things like, oh, you can't cross the path of a black cat. You're going to get bad luck. Right. Or, you know, oh, you spilled salt on the tablecloth that that's bad luck you yeah, have to or, throw some over your shoulder or walk under a ladder that's bad yeah luck and, yeah well it's bad luck walking under a ladder because something can fall on you <laughs> i yeah. guess yeah. that's where it comes from um but yeah that sort of thing right i mean things that we carry with us into adulthood and for some mm-hmm. people they still hold on to those superstitions somehow even though they yeah. they're like, well better safe than sorry right are, are, do the do these things? I mean, did you have the same ones in Portugal? Like, if you step on a crack, you'll break your mother's back. I mean, probably not, because that just is a rhyming thing. Yeah, that's a rhyming thing. We didn't have yeah. that, but uh, we have the salt on the tablecloth. We had yeah. I don't know. Uh, don't, don't. I mean, cross there's paths with a if a black, a black cat, cat crosses your path. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So an old wives' tale. So some children here are playing hopscotch, and little Tina, who's telling the story. She was playing hopscotch and she's singing the step on a crack, you'll break your mother's back. Yeah. And when she's playing, she steps on the crack. And at the same time, her mom falls down the stairs at home yeah. and breaks her back. <laughs> yeah. And after that, uh, little Tina ends up spending recess playing with this mysterious puzzle box yeah. that we don't know where she got. And she never talks to anyone and she's just becoming more and more withdrawn. Yeah. So her teacher, Evelyn Wong, she tries to f- figure out what's going on. This this story sort of reinforces obsessive compulsive, you know, issues where people believe in these weird su- superstitions. Yeah. And so the the teacher's saying, "So what's what's happening? You know, oh, I stepped on a crack and I broke my mom's back." And she's like, "That's just a silly rhyme. You know, just yeah. give me that box and go play with your friends." She's like, "Oh, okay, but as long, as I want that you, box back." Yeah, take care of it. Yeah. And so enter the hag, which I believe our friend Ed Martinez is going to have something to tell us about this hag 
Oh, really? um, yeah, because I believe that this woman that ends up being a puzzle guardian was based off some photos from the original creator of Synovium, Diane Keating. Oh. I think he told me once on the phone that this woman was actually based off of photos of Diane Keating who created Synovium. But we'll oh. figure we'll get back to that uh, when we have Ed Martinez on our episode. Wow. Yeah. So this woman shows up one day to to talk to the teacher Evelyn Wong. Mm-hmm. And she says, stop teaching lies to your students. Yeah, <laughs> right. Right. Yep. She says that uh, that the monsters are real and that the rhymes are real and that she has to to stop telling her students the monsters aren't real. And, and then, then she, she wants says, to take her and show her kind of like uh, Christmas Carol style. Yeah. Yeah. And she even knows the name of the monster that the teacher used to have under her bed when she was a kid. It's like, yeah. Mr. Gruesome was the monster that used to live under your bed. It's like, how do you know that? Yeah. She's like, oh, I know a lot of things. Come with me to this hospital. I'm going to show you this wing of children. And this and is so, a little candy man too, right? Where if you believe in a monster enough or spread rumors about him enough, it makes them real. Yeah. Yeah. So there's this wing of the forgotten children, the unwanted, doomed to spend the rest of their small lives paying for one <laughs> yeah, small right. cent. Yeah, this is so, horrible. I know. It's like they used to tell you if you make a face, it'll freeze that way and it'll stay like that forever. Or, you know, if you touch yourself, you're going to grow hair on your palms and you're going to go blind. Yeah. Uh, Or you sit too close to the TV, it's going to rot your face and your brain. Yeah. And all those kids are there and they all have these ailments. And um, Yeah, and one kid, uh, oh, one kid crossed his heart and hoped to die and somebody stuck a needle in his eye. (laughs) <laughs> so I'm laughing, but this is hideous. Uh, yeah, so it's like, what are th- these children need help? You know, I got to go get a doctor. And uh, the lady is, I, I'm going to show you the truth. You don't understand. I'm going to show you. And she starts turning into a monster. And I got this idea that she turned into the monster that the teacher was afraid oh, of, like Mr. Mr. Gruesome. Gruesome. Yeah, probably. Yeah, she seem, seems that way. And she asks her, you know, maybe Mr. Gruesome needs to start showing up under your bed again. You know, you have to teach you have to teach the children about this propaganda that Leviathan has to keep these stories alive. So, yeah. you know, you have to um, instill order in the mind of the young of structuring their lives. So they'd be structuring the lives with um fear i guess but so she turns on the light and then the monster disappears and one of the kids that's laying on the bed says monsters go away when the light goes on everyone knows that so um so there's some logic to this story right i mean yeah uh, yeah so school the next day so there's the kids are playing hopscotch again and one of the girls is is jumping around and the teacher comes over and says Susie, be careful yeah. You almost stepped on a crack. Remember what happened to Tina's mother? Yeah, what and, a uh, horrible thing to say. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah. It's like, yeah, make sure you open, make sure you walk through the door four times every day or else, you know, something bad will happen. Yeah. So she says, well, gather around, kids. I'm going to teach you all these 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 things that you can't do. So, you know, let the fear guide you, teach you. Someone yeah. has to teach you about, you know, these tales. Keep the fear alive. And uh, and then they don't show you that the next day the board of school directors would be firing this teacher. Yeah, I know. What are you doing? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. And then and then we see that uh, we see that the that there's a Cenobite like little impish guy with puppet strings and the the wig on the other end of it. Right. So it cuts back to the classroom, and uh, the little girl is saying, "That's what I did on my summer vacation," and. Uh, and the teacher's like, oh, my God, you guys are filled with so much hideous stuff. How did this get into you? And they say, uh-uh, teacher, it didn't get into us. We got into there. So it's it's basically saying that, um, yeah, they, 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 they meant hell, of course. They yeah. all got into hell. And like you said, you see the little Cenobite imp, and he's kind of slowly, slowly, like, dropping the hooks over the teacher's head and it's implied that she's going to about to get scalped. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. He's going to take her hair just like he took 
Sister Francis's hair. I mean, Except- she was lucky enough to wear a wig. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's just like, I don't understand what's wrong with you kids. And they're like, it's okay. You will. Yeah. And I feel like this episode should cut out with some Alice Cooper, right? Yeah. Right. If we could. Yeah. yeah summer school's out. Yeah. The end. So, yeah. I, I, yeah. This one, I like the bookend story a little more. I think yeah. it made a lot more sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now that you, yeah. Now that we know that they, they were in hell and they could all be different from different ages and, different time periods and it would still make more sense although this teacher seemed to just kind of wander into it so i don't know how she got there yeah well we know how this the nun ended up in hell because she uh she says that um she uh she used to stop and look at the young stud boy magazines while shopping for feminine hygiene products at the five and dime which i'm guessing is the uh it's like a comic book version of 7-eleven yeah so there you go. Yeah. Sister Mary Frances knew she was going to hell. She just didn't think it would be so soon. That's what opens this. And yeah, yeah I, that's my theory for this is that this is hell. That's yeah. that's exactly where they are. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, that, that was a much better uh, wraparound story. Um, tying them together. You're right. Than the than the Christmas one. And then, um, then our last one, we just go into the poster book, which we we won't spend a whole lot of t- time on it because this is an audio podcast. Um, but I do, I think the posters are great, and most of them we've seen already. Right. These used to be pinups from the Hellraiser comic books. Yeah. Yeah, and but what I there there's some things that I do like. Um, I th- there's little quotes from each artist. Um, you know, uh, there's like a page with like, with um, Hellraiser puzzle box designs on the page, and then quotes from people. And there are right. two of them that are quotes from Clive Barker. Um, actually, three of them, I think. Hmm. So yeah, like, for example, one of them is about uh, George Zafino's art. The guy who did the story with the um, with little Anne was telling like the yeah. devil's absolution. So Clyde Barker says, when I when, when it, I realized its prisoner was weeping, not with anguish, but with laughter and that it was the sight of his own pudenda that coaxed forth such glee. The demon grew so enraged it exploded. Yeah. And it's like, I, I don't know what this is about, but it's a heck of a quote. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah. One of these posters, I actually have the original sketch that he started from to make oh, this. Oh, really? Yeah, the AC Farley one oh, with the like monster that has on yeah. the intestinal leech leash, I guess. Right. Yeah. And apparently, uh the artist named him Gnaw, G N A W, Gnaw, Prince of Darkness. A noble man of the 17th century would have commissioned such a portrait. This one had done so during his previous existence, here you see a portrait of a prince of Leviathan captured here in his regal posture and trails wound cape like around his arm, faithful pet at his heel. So yeah. that's that's really cool. I would totally pet, pet seems to be made out of his stomach. Yeah, it does. <laughs> yeah. And he's got yeah, hands it's... that are like eye stalks with eyes on the ends of his fingers. Yeah, it's a really, really amazing design. I would love to have this on my wall. Yeah. Yeah, really crazy looking monster Cenobite. Yeah, you got some cool stuff here. Some of them are from the first issues, like this one, Ted McKeever, the guy who's got the gigantic scar going all the way down his body. That's from like issue number one or two or something like that. Yeah, 1989, it says at the bottom. Yeah. And then um, there, let's see, I think... And there's that Cenobite with all the knives sticking in his chest. Uh, yeah, that's like issue number three, I think, cover. And there's the uh, Victorian one where they're, uh, all the powdered wig people are around a, a lady with a yeah. ball gown and they're opening up the box. That's, I think, the cover for issue four, right? I think. Yeah. So we have a big big one with Leviathan. That's mm-hmm. an actually pretty cool pretty cool one. And there's one. And you have. Uh, is that the, the clown? Um, yeah, Dinky Wink. Winky Dink, yeah. Winky Dink, yeah, thank you. That Mike Mignola one, yeah, that's a cool one. I yeah. like that the posters um, weren't printed on both sides, so yeah. that way you didn't have to pick whether you wanted to put one on your wall, but you like the other one on the other side. They, they all have, like, the 
the puzzle box pattern on their backs. Mm. So you don't have to pick one or the other. You can just you can put them all up if you wanted. Yeah, that's cool. And then there's one of of Abigor, which is like this is you know whenever you look up Abigor, this is the the portrait you see of her because mm-hmm. this is the best the best uh, view of her. Yeah, that, Dan Gurrison skull stuck on the back of her spike, her back spikes with an eyeball. Yeah, I always thought that she looked like she could be the Cenobite that sits on a pile of heads in the Hellbound Heart. That yeah. would have, that, that would have been a great uh, use for this sort of character. Yeah, um, you have that face uh, from the, Books the, of the, the Damned, sk- I think. From Hellraiser number two, I think. Oh, that's right? what it is, right? Yeah, and it's it's the face, and it's got a puzzle box tattoo on the forehead. Yeah, it's the skin of a face, but just being held. Um, by four chains some really awesome posters you could get out of this um yeah yeah some really really cool ones just looking at them um yeah yeah these are all great i mean i never really actually framed any of these i still have the poster book oh yeah did you ever frame any of these no i didn't have the poster book oh you didn't have it I, i think you can find it pretty easily still on ebay I like that uh, that one of Pinhead by John Bolton. Um, I guess that's like the that's like a big fold out one. Yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. That is a very nice poster. Yeah. Uh, a very nice poster. For, for the Hellraiser series, you always see a poster of that one. Um, that one where he's got fire behind him. Like, right. A, the cover a, of issue number one. Yeah, that's a really common poster, but I think this is a better poster. I have a copy of that. It's pretty big. I uh, it was a promotional. Yeah, it's a promotional one. Uh, that was pretty awesome. So, yeah, uh, one day, I guess, I'll, I'll, I'll be sure to frame a couple of these. Um, not sure when, but I still have the poster book. I may get myself another copy just so I can have one to keep and one to yeah. frame. So this was pretty good. This is this is back in the day when Marvel still made poster books and stuff. Like, they would, yeah. they would make... Uh, swimsuit specials with the x-men and stuff like that oh right Uh, yeah 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 so and i like uh, on page 18 there was a quote from clive that says created to achieve a state of perfect pain leviathan is anguished by the tiniest is anguished by the tiniest joy it too suffers and will do so until there is nothing left in the universe to experience but agony and i really like that one because it kind of shows clive getting into this mythology that that he didn't really he didn't really create the leviathan mythology right i mean it was more pete atkins and tony randall i mean i think he started he might have started help you know helped out with the story sure yeah 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 but he's, he gets so into it and i think he i think he appreciates this mythology that they've created yeah and uh for one of these we were talking about the cover of the Dark Holiday Special by Kevin O'Neill. Mm-hmm. And uh, here's another one. Uh, the I think it's the cover of issue number three, maybe. It's got that Cenobite that's got the cape made out of human flesh. And oh, then he's yeah. got razor blades on his fingers. And here's a quote from the artist saying, Having spent much of my time in comics illustrating the bizarre and the bloody, entering the world of Clive Barker was like slipping into a comfy noose. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it'll it'll ride up with wear. Yeah. I felt right at home but had doubts about the level of torture and sadism acceptable on a Clive Barker comic cover. Usually it's a trade-off. Some blood, no sadism. Some sadism, no blood. I figured, hey, a leather-clad S&M do-it-yourself enthusiast wearing a human skin cape should fit the bill. Hey, <laughs> hey. After yeah. the cover was previewed at a convention, complaints were made and Epic promised it would never see print. Well, here it is again. So I guess <laughs> not only did they put it on the cover of Hellraiser, but they also put it on the poster book. So I guess yeah, right. double win. Yeah, that's funny. That is very funny. And there's another uh, another quote by Clive Barker I liked, too. In, in the pit, there's no coup de gras, no final exhilarating moment of oblivion. The scalpels slice but never dispatch. Teasing the death rattle out until it's an age-long percussion. Oh wow, that's very very poetic, right there. Yeah. Yeah. Now the the thing that uh, I think is a perfect description of what hell would be like for Clive Barker is that it would be like um, a hospital with infinite operating rooms, right? That's yeah. that's what he said. Um, where the Cenobites would be like the uh, surgeons from beyond. Um, yeah, I I think that's a very interesting thing. Like, 
imagine hell as being just this this never ending series of rooms where souls are just being tortured yeah. and being given this not just torture for pain but torture for pleasure as well just exploring what makes them tick and exploring you know what what what's the meaning what what lies behind um flesh and feeling and sensation and what are the limits that we can push it towards and uh are there any boundaries to that when people can't die you know yeah. so what what comes after that um yeah would it get boring after a while yeah would yeah. people just get used to it yeah um like like pinhead right i mean he says um what what was that was a quote that he said on jihad uh, short, short is the, is pain. the pain and long is the ornamentation long such is, as the, yeah something of our faith or something like that right right so that, i think that's cool like the cenobites would uh, you know, twist and turn their own flesh and, and stick things into themselves and sew their their suits into their flesh and to their flesh. And it's like, ultimately, because they live for eternity, the, the, the pain would be short, but the ornamentation, like their transformation would be forever. Um, yeah. Or at least until they decide to change themselves up again. So I think that's a really cool, cool idea. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the poster book was cool. It was a neat, uh, a neat little way to to kind of finish off our our series on the Hell Marvel Epic Hellraiser comics. That was very thorough. I think that was a very <laughs> yeah. thorough uh, series of of uh, analyzing these comic books and seeing what. Uh, I mean, even the poster book, for God's sake! I mean, we even did the poster book. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. And we did also. We already did the. Barkerverse, right? The uh, yes. Razor Line universe. Yeah, we did that we did like talk years about ago. Those. And um, and we did, did we do the we did the Pinhead series too? Yeah, we did that. That was fun. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, I, I like those comic books. They're really really cool. Yeah, I guess we got to do the Harrowers at some point. Yeah, yeah. I don't. It may not be this year because <laughs> now we've spent so much time on these comics you know it's time to get back to the books and and plays and stuff interviews too. and yeah and plays yeah, yeah. and interviews right so that yeah sounds good next um coming up soon i don't know if it's next we're working on it but uh, ed martinez and we'll be talking about uh fanzines and particularly synobium um yeah and then after that we'll barker start... community magazines and stuff like that yeah yeah like dread and and um and lost souls and 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 then this there's this elusive one that we've never actually seen what was it uh, the clive barker society appreciation yeah. society right cabas yeah uh, there's some funny stories that ed martinez has been telling me about that so we'll see what how much we can get into that one yeah yeah and um so that'll be that'll be a fun uh, fun discussion and then then we'll start diving into galilee like we were just talking uh, on our last episode um galilee is one you know that was meant to be uh, a series. The story of the Barbarossa dynasty versus the Giri Giris, dynasty. Yeah. yeah. That should be interesting. Yeah, looking, forward looking forward to that. To yeah. Haven't revisited that book ever since I read it the first time. So. Yeah. And this podcast okay. having no beginning will have no end. You can find the show notes for this episode and join the discussion over at www.clivebarkercast.com where we have news, features, reviews, and links to all the ways you can connect with us. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts and every other place you can find podcasts. Clive Barker Podcast, or BarkerCast, is an independent editorial podcast and news blog that is not affiliated with or under contract by Clive Barker or Seraphim Inc. This is a labor of love by the fans for the fans. Thanks for listening.